Good afternoon to our viewers in Germany and good morning and hello to our viewers in the United States. I'm Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council on Germany, and I want to thank you all for joining us for today's discussion about Europe with Dr. Ulrike Gerou. As many people know, on Monday, February 7th, it was not only um, Olaf Scholz's first visit to Washington as chancellor, but it also marked the 30th anniversary of the Maastricht summit, which laid out the framework for the European Union as it exists today. The Maastricht Treaty officially came into force on November 1st of 1993, and the European Union was officially established. One could argue that this treaty was one of the most important documents that shaped European integration since the Treaty of Rome, which was signed in 1958. The Maastricht Treaty provided the contours for a single currency, a common foreign and security policy, closer cooperation on justice and home affairs, and institutional reforms. Since then, one country has left the Union and 14 new member states have joined. I cannot think of a better person than my friend Ulrike Gerou to talk with us about the legacy of the Maastricht Treaty in today's world. She serves as faculty chair of European politics at the Friedrich Wilhelms University in Bonn and is also the founder of the European Democracy Lab in Berlin. Ulrike, herzlich willkommen and it is wonderful to see you again. Herzlich willkommen, good afternoon to all of you. I'm very, very happy to be with the American Council again. <laughs> Well, I know you've had a busy book because you are a busy week because you're working on a new book project, and we might get into that toward the end of our conversation today. But let's start reflecting on the Maastricht Treaty. I, I'm wondering if you can share with us in broad brushstrokes what lessons we might be able to draw from the Maastricht Treaty 30 years later, and sort of what went right and what went wrong in putting that treaty together. Okay, so first again, very thankful to be with Americans to discuss uh, the Maastricht Treaty, what it has been, what it wanted to be, and what it is today, if there is something um, uh, today out of the Maastricht Treaty. Um, and I want to divide the, your question, Stephen, in two basically segments. Um, if I may, I start with some uh, personal, not to say emotional remarks, because I'm sitting in Bonn, yeah, and Bonn was the capital of the small Federal Republic in 92 when we did the Maastricht Treaty. And by then, I remember quite well, I was 27 years old and I worked for Karl Lamas. Some of you may know him. He was by then the spokesperson for foreign affairs. He was very close to Helmut Kohl and to Wolfgang Schäuble. And he was one of the master spirits behind all this Marx Maastricht architecture. So as a young woman, I actually worked uh, as a staffer, like, you know, like a staffer of the, on the hill in, in, in Washington. And um, I would see all these deputies coming in from France or from the Netherlands uh, discussing sort of the Maastricht Treaty and what should be done. Now, it was a very, very very exciting time for me. So it's true that if you have experienced that period, which was three years after unification, everybody sensed that something needs to happen. We remember Mitterrand was there, Madame Thatcher was there, both were sort of with some anxiety that the new Germany would go somewhere where they did not want to see it. And all these things were just in the air. And there was a huge sort of European moment uh, and a huge commitment by Chancellor Kohl to say, okay, German unification and European unification belong together and that's why we do it. And what do we do? Essentially, it was the treaty on the currency union, basically saying that if we do a currency union, the currency union lays the leeway to political union. This was basically the deal uh, masterminded by the law, uh, Mitterrand and Kohl. So the huge project was that... Uh, and we need to have that emotional moment that all the three, Mitterrand, uh, Kohl and Delors, were um, ch children of the war. They had this uh, very, very strong desire for peace. And you remember probably um, uh, the saying of Mr. Kohl, um, the Euro macht Europa irreversible. Yeah, the Euro makes Europe irreversible. So there was this very strong feeling that we need a treaty that makes history irreversible on the path of European integration. Being here in Bonn in 92, I can just say that it was the way that everybody felt. There was 
really enthusiasm, even if you look into the CSU and other, we wrote this Shabbat Lama's paper in 94, two years later, on political union. So the claim that the Maastricht Treaty was just a step into something even bolder and bigger uh, was basically clear. So looking uh, at the te technical details and uh, of, of the Maastricht Treaty, there were three pillars. The one pillar was this foreign policy sort of thing, yeah, the whole uh, ESDP, European Defense and Security Policy, starting with the Franco-German Eurocorps, interpreted, we need to discuss by the Americans as sort of anti-NATO, sort of the huge old Atlantic conflict. Uh, is there a European defense shaping which goes sort of against the US interest sort of thing, but that was one pillar. The second pillar, as I said, was the currency union, which was the very, very strong pillar uh, decided uh, in Maastricht. And then uh, the third pillar was this interior thing, which later became the Schengen Agreement and this sort of um, home and justice affairs. Yeah. And um, if now, in a, say, 30 years perspective, you go from 92 to uh, 2022, so 30 years, you look at what happened. Essentially, and I think I wrote this in many books, um, you did a three-pillar structure without a roof. Yeah, And the roof, which you would call, it's like a the Greek temple, which you, you planted the pillars, but you never planted some of the, you know, the Greek temple roof. Um, which means that it could rain into everything, yeah? And in a short sort of, if I answer shortly to your question, sort of what after 30 years we come up with, we come exactly up with some with a house without roof in which it rains for 30 years. So it's a little bit rotten, yeah? And there are many elements to that being rotten and this feeling that it never got this political union character. Uh, and the more we go on with the European Union, the less there's an impetus to strive for political union. Yeah, it's very interesting to see that uh, and we can come there in the discussion. But um, it's uh, long ago that uh, the heads and state of governments would stand up on a council and say, oh, big, we need political union. We need a bold step forward. I mean, these times are basically over. Yeah. Um, let's look a little bit in why they are over. And um, <clears throat> the first thing is obviously uh, the enlargement process, because we, we did this integration spin in the 90s, in the 1990s. We finished the currency union in 2002. Let's just shortly remind that it was not a pony ride. It was hard political work. I mean, the, the, the euro, by the way, may I also remind that the US were not so happy with the euro. Uh, the, uh, Bergstein in foreign affairs, the euro will lead Europe to war. I mean, there was serious American intervention in seeing this European uh, currency unfolding, yeah, just as a side story. But still, we got this sort of currency package done. Um, and then came enlargement, and we got the enlargement package done in 2004. There were the 10 countries entering, and two years later, Bulgaria and Romania in 2006. But all this talk about deepening and widening going together, uh, which was the talk in the 90s, uh, basically stumbled when in 2003 the European constitution failed. Yeah, And that was the moment when Europe realized that it had perhaps um, uh, overburdened itself with both enlargement currency union and all this together, whereas the integration package, the constitutional package did not come together. Uh, I need to do a little other footnote that this sort of coincidence of Iraq intervention 203 and the European constitutional moment may not be trivial nor innocent neither. Yeah, I mean, historical mm -hmm. historians may look at what happened there because it is important to have a footnote on the Turkey accession uh, talk, uh, much uh, pushed for by the US government with Condoleezza Rice sitting in the accession uh, negotiations in 2004. Turkey was a problematic issue for most European countries. Probably this Turkish thing um, provoked the French no to the European constitution, which then provoked that the European constitution failed. From the European constitution, we went to Lisbon, wrapping up just bits and pieces of the constitution, but never having this constitutional treaty. From there, with the bits and pieces in our hands, we um, basically stepped into banking union, so we did the whole financial, uh, not banking union, banking crisis. So we had the, the whole banking um, problem that the US had. You had a banking crisis, but um, the essential difference between Europe and the US was that the US could act politically because the US had fiscal and monetary power in one hand. So uh, did not basically hang around with this banking and financial market crisis for so long. 
And uh, all these steps from um, uh, enlargement to failure of constitution, French no, Turkish accession, uh, Lisbon Treaty, banking crisis, and no performance uh, of the European answer, was this sort of rain peering into a system that was politically not capable to act. And because of this got ever more rotten in brackets, right? So um, you can clearly see, perhaps as last sentence here, uh, that the moment that European populism, populism started to grow in you know, 2011, 12, 15 percentage point more for Marine Le Pen or even Hungary, it just is hangs together with the banking crisis. So the very fact that there was no appropriate European answer to this disaster, austerity policy in the South and so on and so forth, was one of these moments where the system, I think, got it wrong. And because the system got it wrong, the popular protest against the system could increase. And it started with the banking crisis and the Southern populism against the Northern countries. And then obviously the next step of the loop was the refugee crisis where the Eastern country also started to go against the EU system. Yeah? And all this together over a 30 years period means that we are way beyond any imagination of political union today, which for me, observing these things since 30 years, more or less, mm -hmm. uh, is, um, is not only a disaster, it's a tragedy, or it's very, very sad. I mean, sad from a very profound emotional uh, standpoint. And I could also talk about the students I have here in Bonn, you know, because it's very interesting to see today's 20 years old, when you question them about mastery and what they know, and the short answer is, they don't know Maastricht. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd like to come back to this generational shift in, in just a moment. But, but first, you know, this, this image that you've given us of the pillars of Maastricht, the sort of house of Europe without a roof, I think is a great way of, of thinking about this. Um, and it's a very important reminder that you've given us about the real enthusiasm about the future of Europe some 30 years ago when Maastricht was being crafted. And it reminds me as somebody who was following this at that time as well, that there's always been a debate between widening and deepening when it comes to the European project. But that in this case, it was really an attempt to do both at the same time. And you and I have talked about this in the past, that it sometimes feels like the European project is moving forward at the pace of two steps forward and one step back. So there is some forward movement, but always at a cost and not quite as quickly as one might expect. And so the question I would have for you is, you know, it sounds as if the Maastricht Treaty did not live up to the hopes and expectations that people had of it. Do you think that's because those hopes and expectations were unreasonable or because a number of the external factors that you talked about really contributed to sort of upsetting the European project and not making it possible to move forward? Well, I think I would tend to your first explanation that it was sort of not designed in a proper way to basically really uh, suit citizens. Yeah, We are now a decade after, I mean, a decade after banking crisis, I think in political science or in sociology uh, at large, we have a more comprehensive analysis of what happened. Yeah. But uh, it reminds me, Stephen, precisely that I think it must have been in April 2011, perhaps you can check up the archives of the American Council, but I was actually in New York, if you remember, for half a year, mm -hmm. and I did a couple of presentations with the ACG and Guido Goldman was still around. And we had a discussion about uh, the effects of banking crisis in Europe, yeah? And it was by then that we discussed in one of these ACG talks, like we do one today, um, uh, sort of that uh, the flip side of the design indeed was that the single market and the currency were done by business and by banks for business and for banks, yeah? And there was something like the forgotten citizen in the whole thing and the forgotten citizen, the citizens that never got their political union right, or their social union. And this was basically what, um, in German, I would say, was uns dann um die Ohren geflogen ist, you know, what, um, how do you say this in English, yeah? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, um, it was the talk of the town, it was, I mean, that was what, what the, the main issue was at that moment. 
Yeah, and 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 so uh, now you know Adam Toos, for instance, from Colombia, has uh, written this marvelous book about the crash. Yeah, uh, and uh, the thick book about the crash. But there is evidence now. If you read uh, Habermas, you you would read Klaus Offer. Yeah, uh, Europe Entrapped, Hauke uh, Buchholz. So basically, European political science comes up with the fact that indeed. Uh, the citizen as the subject of political entity. If we reason in terms of constitutional political union, you need a citizenship sort of thing. You need the political subjects of that European entity, which never came along, right? And um, and there is uh, uh, now basically agreement and analysis that this um, uh, has never happened. And it has been uh, emerging in the banking crisis as the big flip side of the European construction. And so what happens, and it's the sort of academic discussion today, that we can clearly see that the mécontentement, so the unhappiness with the European sort of EU project as such, like the techno structure, like they say, you know, all these uh, people who were in the alter Europe argument. Yeah, we want Europe, but not this EU. This EU is giving us... This EU is going to the Greeks and to the Portuguese and uh, wiping off their retirements and, and all these things. Yeah, all these discussions we had. That this was basically the moment what you got, what, what, what we call in critical science, the emergence of the citizens as agents. Yeah. Sort of the citizens became aware that they, they were the betrayed subjects of the whole Maastricht undertake, uh, undertaking, that the banks and the companies got what they wanted, but not the citizens. Yeah. And so you can say that a decade ago, precisely in, you know, in the banking crisis moment, 2011, 2012, that this was the moment of the awareness of citizens as agents and a paradigmic, paradigmatic change in the discussion, because since ever then, we talk about European democracy rather than about European integration, which is very important. I don't know whether this has been noticed um, in American political science. I know that the US is no longer discussing so much the issues of the EU, perhaps beyond Andrew Moravchik, who is still around sometimes with an article. But uh, I know it's not the, the, the most important topic. Yeah, But for European political science, it's a very important to point to the banking crisis as moment where the debate shifted from European integration, where states are the agents of the uni of the unification or the integration moment for, to European democracy, where the citizens are the agents, right? And that is the moment where you see all these NGOs coming, like uh, um, uh, Euro Alta, European Alternatives, Diem, Volt, uh, Pulse of Europe. I mean, all these sort of super active, uh, bottom-up grassroots movements who was spreading over the European Union since roughly a decade, right? So um, I think um, this is a point taken in the European discussion today, that, that, that there was a flip side and that we need to repair that flip side. And to just to spring into today's politics, because the European Union has realized this manco, yeah, the flaw of... Uh, Short comment shortcoming, bad connection with its citizens, Mrs. von der Leyen is actually running what we call the Conference on the Future of the European Union, which is a super wild felt field experience because 300,000 citizens are actually interviewed, randomly chosen in the internet uh, with a very clear sort of um, uh, diversity, I mean, gender, age, proportion, everything is uh, realized. And 300,000 people are interviewed through a process of moderation about the future of Europe. So the European Union has um, realized its flaw, is taking in the citizens now. And uh, if somebody wants to Google these things, it's all on the website of the European Commission. There have been a couple of citizens assemblies in, 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 in Venice, in, uh, in Dublin, in, in, in Lisbon, many. And it's very interesting to see like ordinary citizen, you know, so women from Slovakia with an old man from Portugal sitting in a room and basically discussing the future of Europe. So there is something happening. I'm not overestimating sort of the big sort of thing coming out of this citizens conference, but still we need to acknowledge that the European Union is looking at this and uh, trying to compensate. But Ulrike, it's it's fascinating to hear you talk about sort of the, the evolution of who is shaping the future of Europe, whether it's you know the, the nation state and the national leadership of the member states, or whether it's now the citizens um, of Europe who are sort of shaping the future of Europe. And so um, it actually provides an opportunity for me to fold in one question from one of our viewers, because you talked about European integration, of course, and at the same time, it's also important to talk about 
disintegration. And I think the biggest example of disintegration that we all know of is Brexit and the fact that the UK left the European Union. So one of our viewers writes, can you talk about the impact of Brexit on the European project and on the European economy in general? Well, yes, I can. Thank you for the question. And indeed, it's the it's the best uh, example to to make my point. And rightly, as the as the questionnaire said, the UK left the EU, but only half of the European of the uh, British citizens wanted to leave. Yeah, let me let me right. stay here. Yeah, I mean, we are right. talking thirty years about the Maastricht Treaty. The Maastricht Treaty, in essence, legally, was what Union of States, Union of Citizens. Yeah. Everything I tried to explain so far is that the Union of States was basically materialized. We have the council who decides, blah, blah, blah. But the Union of Citizens, which is also in the basics of the Maastricht Treaty, Article 1 to Article 12, has never materialized, right? And I tried to explain that the European Union paid a high price for this during banking crisis when this came to daylight, right? So now, one of these uh, consequences of reigning into the house getting rotten was then Brexit as one of the first articulation of anti-systemic critique. We don't want this EU and the UK went down this route. But here's the thing, and I'm pretty engaged in this because I went to the European court myself. Um, we asked the European court last year um, whether the very fact that um, the United Kingdom, based on Article 50, left the European Union means that the British citizens lose European citizenship. Huh? Because mm -hmm. if you say that there's Union of States and Union of Citizens, which are basically um, uh, symmetric, then you could argue that if a state as a state leaves the EU, it does not mean that the British citizens as citizens leave um, uh, European citizenship, right? We lost mm -hmm. the case for now, but we go again to the court because we want to we want to tease the European court a little bit more on this, yeah? But what it shows is that we are, I think, with respect to the Maastricht Treaty, at a moment where we want to tilt the balance from Union of States to Union of Citizenship, which embraces the question of who is the sovereign after all, who decides. The analysis, yeah, the, the, the quick analysis is, oh, now there is an anti-system sort of uh, populism against the EU, and then the UK leaves and Poland, Poland leaves, Polexit, Exit, whatever, yeah. But the more fine analysis is that all countries are divided in themselves about Europe. There's not one country in general against the EU. It's not the Poles, not the Hungarians, not the Austrians, not even the British. Yeah, It basically splits all the countries into two pieces. Be reminded that, for instance, Budapest is the most um, Europhile uh, country uh, or town in the European Union. Yeah, This is to mm -hmm. say that even in the Brexit, in the Brexit um, uh, discussion, uh, obviously, there are now uh, problematic reactions. Yeah, I mean, one is that um, what did not happen, which I had hoped for, that there is more Franco-German sort of energy because the Brits are out. You could have expected that there is something really happening on the Franco-German side. There's something happening on the Franco-German side, but not sort of the big unity. Yeah, obviously, there is a problem about the military. I mean, we knew that the UK was very, very important in all this defense stuff. Now you see, for instance, the Ukraine Johnson deal. Uh, I mean, th th there are a lot of problems arising through Brexit, and I'm not even talking about the economy. But uh, with respect to the economy, things look darker from the British side than from the European side. Yeah, the UK still needs to import a lot of stuff from the European Union and has uh, problems to catch up, whereas the European Union is basically fine. Yeah, so that's more a pity for the UK than anything else. Yeah, but the interesting thing, coming back to my structural analysis, which is did the UK leave as state? And what does it mean for the citizenship question is that we have a very strong, observe this, discussion in Scotland. And Nicola Sturgeon is decided to go again for referendum, to, to go again for um, independency referendum. And the interesting, and it's not only Scotland, it's also Wales, if you look. You know, I've talked recently to people from Cardiff. Yeah, so it's Wales. It's, there, there is a, I, the Irish thing is also there. So um, the tendency in general to see that who is driving the European discourse, it's the regions, 
who want mm -hmm. more autonomy and independence, but who want the European rules. Scotland does not want to become a nation state and be out of Europe, but it wants to be Scotland in Europe. And so wants Catalonia to be Catalonia in Europe. Yeah? And then you have the towns as actors. Look at the city of London, look at towns. So my meta trend assumption would be that we are moving away from state formations like Franco-German relations and all these things, which are more the class classical features of European policy, but these are more or less old fashioned. And the new things are the citizens, are the towns, are the regions and new dynamics. And the real question is whether the EU can make something out of this, yeah? Because this reflects more, if you say regions, if you say towns, if you say citizens, it reflects more the heterogeneity of each and every um, EU country, yeah? Mm -hmm. so, so related to that, I wanna come back to your comment before about what some of your students in Bonn or before that in, in Austria were saying and how they were responding to this. Do, do they identify more with their region or with their nationality? Well, let's first say that they, <coughs> what I experienced is something like, um, <clears throat> I call it historical illiteracy. Yeah, I mean, the students you have today are born around the year 2000. So everything which is before 2000 is um, not present. <laughs> Uh, everything which is not in the internet is not present. It's, it's very important to, to have this in mind, right? I mean, uh, uh, if you ask them what is the Maastricht Treaty, if you ask them how the currency, the European currency names were before the Euro, they would not know, you know? I mean, today is 20 years old in my class and we are not talking, uh, I mean, we are not talking uh, uh, non-students, yeah? You're talking students, master students of political science and you ask them, okay, give me the names of the currency before the Euro, like Escudo, Lira and so on and so forth and they wouldn't know, yeah? So it shows that there is a process of basically historical illiteracy that everything that was before, what you didn't experience, you, you are not aware of, yeah? So even all these things that we would still know because even we all experienced this, you know, moment of the fall of the wall, 89, 92, this sort of big historical moment uh, for them is history as many other things as history. So you ask them who is Jacques Delors, they wouldn't know. You, uh, mm -hmm. you ask them what's the Maastricht Treaty, they wouldn't know. They wouldn't know that the currency union is based on the Maastricht Treaty, all these things. So there's a huge historical illiteracy and um, it makes that they look on Europe from a very, um, say, uh, from their standpoint of socialization, say they are born around 2000, then they are socialized, you know, first political thinking around 10, 11 years old, yeah, mm -hmm. so this is banking crisis, yeah, and even the banking crisis, uh, I realize is not really in their uh, DNA, yeah, because banking crisis was probably too too complex or not really tangible. So they are not marked by the banking crisis. But what they are marked by is this race of populism and Brexit and uh, nationalism. Yeah, and so mm -hmm. they're there and they are basically all young, all. Uh, 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 idealistic, they all want a united Europe, they want an anti-racist Europe, uh, they want uh, opening of the borders, they want uh, Europe that is kind to the refugees, they want all these things, yeah, and they're sitting there, they cannot explain why Europe is in such bad shape. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, because there is this sort of historical illiteracy and the non-knowledge of where do we come from. Mm -hmm. So, so before turning to Germany, because I certainly want to ask you a little bit about, about Germany, um, I have a couple of, of sort of more structural questions from some of our viewers. One of our viewers is wondering whether you can talk a little bit more about the enlargement process itself and whether there was a significant impact mm -hmm. due to the speed of enlargement and just the number of countries that were brought into the European Union, whether that also contributed to this sort of malaise that you're talking about? Well, you know, like uh, it's always easier ex post than if, when you are in the process. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's pretty easy to say, yes, perhaps that might be too quick or too many countries or whatsoever. And we should have been uh, delaying this. Uh, but uh, if I may remind, uh, the United States <laughs> was <laughs> a strong postpone. I mean, the US was also very, very mm -hmm. strong in driving the process. Yeah, let's remind that it was a NATO-EU process. It came together. 
that uh, the US was very, very, very strongly pushing for all these countries into NATO. I mean, there is a big talk also, you know, with Ukraine and what Putin is doing now. But remember that uh, we have now some historical evidence of, about what Genscher promised uh, to um, Yeltsin about who would go into NATO. Yeah. Um, and then uh, it came quicker than expected uh, because not only Eastern Germany, United Germany, but then Visegrad countries, so Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, but then Baltic countries and then Romania, Bulgaria. Remember Georgia 2008, remember Maidan, all this, yeah? But let's go back to the 2004 movement. I think it's very important to remember that it was a double track and it was a NATO EU track. And let's also remember, if we look back at people like uh, uh, Radek Sigorski, for instance, who worked at the European Enterprise Institute in, in the US, I, I remember sitting for breakfast with Radek, uh, who then became foreign policy minister in, in 2001, uh, when we were upfront enlargement. And uh, all these people by then, I mean, most of the Eastern country people, be it Baltic country representatives or Polish people, would basically uh, um, uh, put emphasis on NATO enlargement than on European enlarge enlargement. Yeah, From today's expected experience that may look different, but by then it was security first. It was being in the NATO bed for the security factor. And the EU was a cake on a cherry on the cake, which is sort of some European money for transformation of the economy and so on and so forth. So um, it's a little bit, um, I don't know the English word, music. Um, mm -hmm. it's yeah. A little, yeah, it's frustrating a bit, or uh, not frustrating, sort of uh, uh, um, uh, senseless uh, to discuss. Yeah. Uh, uh, to discuss whether it was good or not. It was just like, you know, the contemporaries decide in a given moment under the pressures of that moment. And under the, mm -hmm. the pressures of that moment, there was a pressure. Remember that we wanted to do also in the end of the 90s, we discussed these different models like regatta model, who comes first, comes in, and the others need to wait. Mm -hmm. Also, this created too many tensions. Then it was decided everybody needs to come in at one moment, you know. So th there was this sort of run on the EU, and it was a big run. Uh, it was also supported by German business, especially German business who, who, who said, okay, this enlarges markets and it, it's very good. So we were basically, remember, I mean, we were Europe whole and free. That was the wording, Europe whole and free. And it was an American wording. It was the wording of uh, Bush uh, uh, Jr., and uh, nobody could wait, yeah? Uh, remember the books who were written. I mean, Jeffrey, uh, uh, what's the book? Who was, um, uh, um, Gold, uh, not Gold Race, um, uh, Rifkin, Jeremy Rifkin. Uh, why the European will outspace, uh, the European dream will uh, uh, outbail the American dream. I mean, this, this Rifkin book who basically sang the praises of the European constitution and why now, then it was Mark Leonard, remember 2003, why yeah. Europe will run the 21st century. I mean, exactly. 2003, we were basically in the bubble of happiness, yeah? I mean, we had dec decreted the end of history. This was Fukushima, uh, Fukuyama, uh, um, yeah. uh, a decade ago, but in the 2003, let's face it, the US was on the downturn because you had this uh, Iraq uh, not so clean story. Huh? And Europe was there with Solana, with the European security strategy. We intended a constitution. We had enlargement. We had the euro. And there was this sort of, now we will win the US-European game in a way, right? So I would not argue that uh, it was um, a, a mistake. It was just by then the good thing to do and the pressure anyway. Uh, that it unfolded not in the way we could have expected um, is quite a different story. Yeah? And it has a lot to do with so, everything that happened. <clears throat> yeah, and, and certainly from what you're saying, there was a lot of hope um, and, and a lot of positive expectation about how Europe would develop and how Europe would form, particularly after the Cold War. Um, and one of our our viewers um, is is curious as to how this this institution, how the European Union can be fixed in order to make it more functional. Um, you know, coming off of what you just said and the fact that there were really, you know, very positive viewpoints that people had that, that Europe was whole and free again, um, that democratic values were, were prominent um, and that there was a sense that all of Europe wanted to be um, democratic together. 
the framework was also one where decisions made by the collective needed to be made by everybody who was a member of the European Union. And that's kind of paralyzed the European Union today. And so this, this one viewer is curious, how does one move on from that? How does one move forward? Well, I think uh, things are a little bit more complex. I mean, I can uh, also point you to this article I wrote to Klingendale because I analyzed basically in five sequences uh, what went wrong in the institutional making and where, as a German, you know, I, I always think you never blame other countries, but you have the right to blame your own country. So uh, I'm pretty critical about uh, some of the things Merkel did. And um, to be very precise, uh, there were shifts under the German uh, Merkel uh, government um, mm -hmm. in especially the, the second government, not the first, but the second government, so the time 2009 to 2013. And to be very precise, um, uh, her speech in Brugge in November 29 um, uh, was one of the game-changing things. And then came the Barroso Commission, and it was the first commission when Germany left basically the essentials of its, of its foreign policy or European policy that it had before. Before, roughly speaking, uh, Germany had three basic which was always Franco-German, always supranational, so um, promoting the Commission and the European Parliament against the Council, against the intergovernmental sort of entity, and um, uh, helping the small countries. And all of these three things shifted in the 2009 thing when Merkel, by the wording, proclaimed that we should shift from what she called Gemeinschaftsmethode to Unionsmethode. So from community method to union method, right? So basically Merkel undertook a very a significant game-changing thing from uh, supporting the supranational elements of the institutions to the more intergovernmental ever, uh, elements. And this helped Barroso in his two uh, commissions to basically no longer promote himself like big projects like Jacques Delors had uh, the Grand Projet, so the single market, the currency, the law, I worked for the law, always called this uh, the Grand Projet. But uh, Barroso understood himself more as a moderator of national interests. So there was a clear shift of how the institution worked. And all this came along a moment, when you remember, in the banking crisis, 2009, we are in the middle of the banking crisis. And it came along with um, so the, the shift to more intergovernmental features of running the European EU uh, fall into a moment when Germany itself lifted its uh, weight in the structures, in the intergovernmental structures of the EU. So basically it was a, a hegemonization of Germany in the governance of the EU, I called it. There was a lot of talk, as, 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 as especially, I mean, this is why, uh, I mean, in this period, I really liked the American analysis, yeah? I mean, the Americans were louder on this, like Stieglitz or um, Hans Kudnami. I mean, the Anglo-Saxon analysis were much better on this to point to the hegemonization, Germany as hegemon in the structures of the Euro governance, something the Germans never wanted to listen. I wrote a couple of things uh, on this. And uh, when I wrote them, I was bashed in Germany. Nobody wanted to self accept this self critique that Germany was by sheer dominance running the system after having shifted the system from a super, more supranational to a more say hegemonic or intergovernment structure. Yeah, But this is a very, very important moment because what it means is that um, if you go detail, we had uh, uh, the, the, the idea uh, to come over banking crisis with the, uh, what is called GEMU, uh, Genuine Economic and Monetary Union proposal from December 2012, Germany was against. Uh, then there was this proposal of a European unemployment scheme, which would also be a supranational sort of uh, social pillar scheme, 2014, refused by Germany, Sigmar Gabriel, yeah, in the European Council. Uh, then uh, a second edition of the Genuine Economic and Monetary Union in June 2015, which really Germany wiped from the table. So there were at least three or four years in which Germany really was super, super dominant. If you want to read uh, good things about this from other countries' perspective, um, like uh, from France, for instance, you can go to the blog of Jean Quatremer, who's a French uh, journalist and who has a blog, uh, Coulisses de Bruxelles, Les Coulisses, Coulissen, uh, Coulisses, Kulissen of Brussels, yeah. Um, yeah, wie sagt man Kulissen? 
<laughs> I can see it. Um, you look behind. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can see it too. I can see it too. I'm, 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 I'm having a, a moment. Anyway, I think you understood me. So um, there was a clear, clear um, difference between what other countries would experience and what Germany would be doing, and this sort of we decide alone approach, yeah, which Germany clearly did in the uh, um, uh, banking crisis years has then been pursued in the refugee crisis as a structural pattern. Because mm -hmm. even if content-wide, I was happy that Germany would uh, invite these refugees, yeah, or sort of there is, but the, 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 the fault line is um, in der Sache richtig, in der Form falsch. So uh, in content right, but in form wrong, means that when Merkel opened the border in 2015 in August, she did not consult the European partners. So she had a unilateral sort of moment here. And this unilateral in the structures, which only could take place because Germany previously had given up on supranational sort of uh, functioning structures and lifted the intergovernmentalization of the European Union, then turned sour. Because um, uh, in the banking crisis, it turned the, the south against Germany, sort of what is Germany deciding is not good for us. But in the refugee crisis, it obviously turned the eastern countries against her because she decided we let the refugees in more or less, you know, Balkan route open. Uh, but then when Germany was overwhelmed by a million of refugees, then she turned to the European neighbors sort of, can you help us? And then Orban and company said, why should we help you? Uh, you didn't ask us, right? So um, I would argue that if you want to overcome this, um, uh, I think with respect to Germany, it's a little bit like um, rather than pointing with fingers on others, you know, there are three fingers pointing back. So I think there's a huge mm -hmm. responsibility of German structural European policy making, which truly went wrong. And I myself, and I write this in the Klingendijk arc article, I myself have been um, not disappointed, but puzzled by the fact that international commentating on Merkel overlooked this. <laughs> because the international commentating on Merkel was uh, pretty much this, the only remaining reader of the free world, which is true. You know, I do not want to criticize Mrs. Merkel. I mean, I, I do not want to, I mean, um, uh, you know, it's that's not my thing. But um, to overlook how um, Merkel got this shining sort of image as the remaining leader while destroying, in a way, the structural mechanisms of the EU functioning, I think this has been overlooked by many of the commentators, even now when she left office in, uh, in September. Um, and it has not been um, lifted to awareness, because if we want to overcome, that is your question, Germany needs to change, basta, period. Mm -hmm. uh, and that helps me to point you to one thing, perhaps, because that is perhaps the hope. If you go the coalition uh, agreement, the new coalition agreement, yeah, um, uh, you go line uh, 4413 to 4421. There is a para on the conference on the future of the European Union, and it says that the new government wants the conference on the future of the European Union to become a permanent convention and once mm -hmm. that out of this permanent convention uh, becomes a European federal state. So the, the ambition of a federal European state is in the new coalition agreement. Yeah, Be aware, mm -hmm. that should be interesting for the United States too. Yeah. So you totally anticipated the direction that I wanted to go in because I did want to, to come to Germany and, and wanted to highlight the Klingendale Spectator article of yours from July <laughs> of last year, because I think it provides a really good analysis of Merkel's 16 years in office um, and her four um, um, legislate, legislative periods in office. And you distinguish between those and, and what happened. And so I'd like to ask you one quick question about, about some of the things that happened in that time and then sort of come back to today. And the quick question is, you know, particularly given what you just said about, about Merkel's response to the financial crisis and to the migration crisis, do you think it's fair to say that Germany took a Sonderweg and tried to ask the rest of Europe to follow? Or was Europe trying to, or was Germany trying to really show leadership? Was Merkel trying to show leadership? Well, I would say that in a way, Germany uh, ran away with the fruits of European integration, say with the fruits of the single market and the currency, which basically feed it into the German basket. And when the moment had come to 
put a political project in the roof, you know, the roof I was talking about. It could have been done. I remember, you know, I was so many times with George Soros in Germany uh, visiting people in 2010, 11, 12. Re read the books of George Soros, yeah? I think George mm -hmm. was right by then, yeah? Germany needs to do Europe bonds, which is fiscal unity, put a fiscal and a social project uh, surrounding the single market and the currency. Remember that this was discussed. Read the Financial Times of 10th of December 2010. I, I know perfectly the dates, but that was the article with Steinbrück, Steinmeier and Peter Buffinger, where the three SPD figures basically called for euro bonds. And the day after the project was killed, I don't know who killed it, but it was pretty clear that uh, in Germany was all this talk about, you know, the AfD was on, on the rise and uh, no transfer union and we don't pay for the lazy Greeks and the lazy Italians, you know, all this talk, distorted talk, yeah, distorted talk. But uh, mm -hmm. if you um, uh, if if you ask me uh, sort of um, what it was, what Germany did is that in a moment of time where it could have given or hold the promise that it did in 89, German and uni European unification belong together. Germany could have done this in 2012, say, right? Mm -hmm. Doing Eurobonds, mm -hmm. yeah? It did not do it. Mm -hmm. For me, it's the it was the biggest mistake ever that by then we did not do it. Imagine we had, it, we had done it. Imagine we had a European unemployment scheme by 2014. Uh, no, not so uh, heavy austerity policy consequences in the European South. Uh, we would have had a better liquid uh, currency market, uh, probably better dealing with the refugee crisis and all of this, mm -hmm. yeah, because uh, uh, much depends on a functioning sort of euro thing. And this is still open, like, as the big sort of scissors, uh, mm -hmm. uh, abyss in, in the European policy. And, uh, you know, I was recently in France and talked this through. I mean, the thing is that most of the southern countries see it still that way. Yeah? So um, and now uh, going to, act, uh, to, to, to now, I mean, perhaps now with the pandemic and this rescue package, yeah, which is this package that we signed in July 2020, the first sort of lending capacity of the European Union, 70, 50 billion, like an entry into fiscal capacity, which is sort of doubling the EU budget. Yeah, perhaps that is the 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 the, the answer to this problem. Mm -hmm. But I would then argue it's a very belated answer. Yeah, ten years too late, and I am personally very sorry that we need a virus to make us doing the right thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so obviously, Ulrike, um, or at least obviously to me, I mean, you are a scholar of France just as much as you are of Germany, and, and many of our conversations over the years have had to do with that Franco-German engine at the core um, of Europe. And so I'd like to, to maybe ask you a little bit about what's going on in France right now. And, and with a new government in Germany, you did talk about the coalition agreement, um, is France, is Emmanuel Macron uh, looking to sort of take um, the, the leadership of Europe onto his mantle um, as opposed to, to being in Germany? Okay. Uh, I, uh, I have one sentence that I want to add to my last response on mm -hmm. this sort of journey, run away with the fruits and didn't talk promise on political union. Yeah, Because it's very important to point to the fact that during banking crisis, when uh, Germany could have done Eurobonds, you know, what Soros, uh, uh, Stieglitz, I mean, <laughs> whatever, yeah. Uh, yeah. well, most of most of the Anglo-Saxons by then judged that Germany does it wrong. Yeah, too little, too late was the American reproach, the the British American mm -hmm. reproach. Yeah? And so it's very and, and I sided with the uh, Anglo-Saxon argument by then. Yeah, but I was bashed in Germany, so it's it's very. Much, but at the same moment, what happened is that Germany turned to China. So basically, Germany sacrificed the single market and and, and thought that it could get sort of the Chinese sort of thing. Yeah, so it ran behind the Chinese money. Today we know that China is not so not such an easy partner, and there are flip sides uh, dealing mm -hmm. with China. But it was a very very important momentum seeing Germany that the moment. I mean, for me, it was. You remember the Lagarde interview with the trade imbalances, you know, in in, yes. in, in, in spring 2011, when this Lagarde interview came, which was a super good analysis that Germany needs to uh, look at the trade imbalances and, and hold Europe together. What did Germany do? Basically, 
lose Europe, run China, and say, basta. Yeah? For me, it was a very tragic moment. I mean, uh, and, uh, and I think history, when the archives will open, there's still uh, something to look at. Yeah? And by the way, it could be very interesting to do this in an American joint perspective, to look at this uh, precise moment of, um, of what happened. I think it's a very uh, important point in, 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 in Atlantic history. Yeah? But now to France. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Emmanuel Macron seems to be He's a, sort of the, the, the big leader now that uh, Olaf Scholz is still finding himself and uh, perhaps too silent or has just been in the US received by Biden, but it's not really clearly outspoken and uh, Macron is already around. Um, let me say this. I was in Paris two years, two days ago, and I had uh, in-depth talks with uh, French uh, officials and uh, nobody knows what is going to happen. Yeah. But probably France is more in unrest or uh, disarray than one thinks. This does not mean that Macron will lose the election, but it's not sure that he will win the elections neither. Yeah? So what I've been told, and I can only um, forward to you, is everything is possible. Everything is possible mm -hmm. means that it's not excluded that you see Macron-Marie Le Pen, even not included to see macron Zemmour even not excluded Macron, uh, Valérie Precresse, who is the new candidate from the right, from the conservatives, mm -hmm. the Republican. So everything is open. Um, this weekend, there should be huge demonstrations in France against more or less everything. Yeah, VEX passes, uh, but also agricultural policy, Gilets Jaunes, everybody on the street in France. So it might be, uh, we will see what, what is happening, but France is not in good shape. Yeah. Um, let's also remind that Macron is on a fragile ground. He, we mm -hmm. had a very low uh, participation at French presidential elections last time, so roughly 60%, which is very low. So in essence, Macron is, as of today, elected by something like 18% of the population, yeah, if you do the pro ratio. Yeah. So um, the, 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 the party movement, La République en Marche, has not been establishing. Uh, les Français en marche. So uh, this mm -hmm. sort of uh, La République en marche as a party formation is, is not around. Yeah? So Macron may win, but even if he wins, France is not in good shape. So there is a discrepancy between Macron's international standing and his European speeches and what he does with Putin, with Ukraine and Normandie format and sort of the basis on which he stands. Yeah, in mm -hmm. political science, uh, we call it le bloc bourgeois, which is that basically um, Macron uh, runs with the upper class population, be it left or be it right, but the more liberal pro-European on the left and on the right against the lower part of the population, which mm -hmm. are uh, artisanat, the little um, shop owners. Uh, and, uh, and shop owners. Well, yeah. So there is... Uh, the uh, clear sort of horizontal shift now, a horizontal line in the party system rather than a left uh, right uh, line. And it's very interesting, uh, you probably listened to it, but there will be no left candidate in the second round. Yeah? So the left is just mm -hmm. nowhere, nowhere. Mélenchon, uh, Anne Hidalgo, and uh, the Greens are just nowhere. Yeah? So we will have a, a, a race between a moderate right and a more or less extreme right. Yeah? Um, mm -hmm. So on this, if if you then 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 the interesting question is, what does it mean that if the basis, the political basis of Macron is so fragile, what does it can Macron then be a leader? The answer is clearly mm -hmm. no. Yeah, because uh, mm -hmm. uh, the discrepancy between the international standing and what he wants on Europe, the six speeches, the Macron speech in Aix la Chapelle, in Aachen, in Br Brussels, in Athens, in Sorbonne. Uh, are huge speeches, have not been answered by Germany unless this rescue package, which has been done on signed in, in, 27, in 2020. But uh, the real question is, uh, can France uh, stem this movement? And I'm, I'm, I'm saying I'm not convinced, you know, like Fischer said to Mr. Rumsfeld in a way. Yeah. I wish it were. I wish it were. I think Macron, I can say I have a lot of critiques of Macron who started as ni droite ni gauche, who started as social liberal, but turns out more liberal than social, which I personally find really 
problematic for France. So uh, it's not that I want sort of uh, shouting the, the louange of, uh, of Macron. Mm -hmm. But I think in terms of European policy, he is right. And offering this, uh, you know, what he wants is this strategic autonomy. He wants strategic autonomy in terms of foreign policy. This is the whole, Europe, you know, European army, European armament, whatever uh, strategic uh, side. There's also this GAFA, say, taking away the digital things from the US. I mean, European data on European server, Nokia, uh, SAP, we need to build a European GAFA. Yeah, that's always what Macron mm -hmm. says. So going anti-Google, anti-Amazon. And so personally, I would say yes. I mean, I'm not anti-American, but uh, I do not want my data on the European mm -hmm. uh, American servers. It's a big, big thing, yeah, because there's big money engaged and, you know, all these tricky, tricky dossiers that we cannot tax these tech companies here, that Google mm -hmm. always wins and Facebook and Zuckerman always win. And if Zuckerman shows up at the European Parliament, he ridiculizes the European Parliament. I mean, as a decent European, you cannot want this. Yeah? So there's something in the cyber war thing where Europe needs to be bolder and, and Macron is pretty active on this, but uh, past dependency works. And uh, you have seen that past dependency works, which means that Europe is unfortunately, in my opinion, in a double track, which is that it is, um, say, strategically dependent from the US, like, uh, uh, you know, militarily, NATO and so, and economically uh, from China. Yeah. So the, this whole talk about independency yeah, and, and sovereignty, European sovereignty, lacks the problem that Europe uh, is basically, in terms of geo-economy and geo-strategy, double-binded to China and the US, yeah, which makes it really hard to, to, mm -hmm. to, to be, I mean, unless we, uh, unless we come to grips, which we say we should do since 30 years, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Ulrike, you... you did a masterful job of folding in the last topic that I wanted to raise with you, namely European autonomy and European sovereignty into your last few sentences. And I have to say this hour has gone by incredibly quickly. Um, I have learned a lot as I always do when I speak with you, um, but maybe we need to have you back in a few months to talk about where we are when it comes to this strategic dependence and economic dependence and where things are going with European autonomy and, and European sovereignty, because I think this is a topic that will be with us for some time to come. Um, so perhaps in the run up to the French election or after the French election, we can we can talk again and see where Europe is at that point. But for today, I just want to thank you for joining us. This has been a fantastic discussion, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Many thanks, and uh, the first uh, occasion will be the good occasion to come back to the American Council and to the United States uh, under the condition that New York is in the <laughs> in the in the yes. basket. And uh, for those who want to read a little bit more on the sovereignty sort of thing, there you can perhaps point to this other paper I wrote on Macron and his notion on sovereignty, which I wrote for Institut des Democrates, where, where I try to detail uh, that ambition for European sovereignty and how how difficult it is actually. Yeah, but I'm very very keen and eager to catch up the discussion with the US. I think there's so much around after the pandemic how Europe will come out after the pandemic, uh, there is this whole thing, which I think also in the transatlantic dimension we should have on the radar, which is this transhumanism discussion, what it means to our political system. I'm just bringing out a book on this. So um, I hope to be in the US very, very soon. And there is smart discussion well, in the US. <laughs> we, look, we look forward to having you here. And, and as I said before we went live, we would, we would love to, to organize some talks for you um, in New York, but also uh, across the country at our chapters. So I look forward to being in touch with you about that.